Hello, everybody. Jim Kirkaruto with Outdoor Stewards of Conservation Foundation here. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's webinar. We've got an extremely important topic that we want to discuss today, and that's Native Americans' participation in and perceptions toward hunting, trapping, and target shooting. But before we get started on the meat of the research project, I want to give you a little background on Outdoor Stewards. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization with a mission to use research-based communication and engagement programs to help recruit the next generation of hunters, anglers, and target shooters, or what we call HATs, and promote the fact that those HATs are primary funders and stewards of land, fish, and wildlife conservation in America. And this research project fits perfectly in with our mission statement. We conducted a really dedicated study. We learned a lot of great insights, and we're going to use those insights to help recruit the next generation. So when there's no way that Outdoor Stewards of Conservation could do this project by ourselves. So we reached out and recruited a great team that's got vast amount of knowledge on this topic. And the team includes Chuck War, who's a tribal member of the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians, Forrest Parker, who's a tribal member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, and Brian Shearwood, who's founder of Shearwood Enterprises. So when the team first got together, we discussed what is it that we want to learn? What do we need to know? What are the objectives of this research? And the number one thing that rose to the top is we need a baseline. There's really not been research done on this topic. So we needed to understand what is current participation rates in hunting, in trapping, and in target shooting among the Native American population. We also wanted to measure what the cultural acceptance and tradition of hunting, trapping, and target shooting was among Native Americans as well. Our second objective was to understand the barriers to entry and also understand what opportunities there are that drive consideration to start participating in hunting, trapping, and target shooting. Our third objective for the study is very unique to this study, and that's because many Native Americans have an opportunity to hunt both on reservation and off reservation. And they're also afforded um, different privileges among Native Americans based on their tribal affiliations. So this study, we sought out to identify the awareness of those privileges and also measure the usage of those privileges as well. And our last objective for the study was to create a benchmark of the perceptions that Native Americans have of state wildlife agencies and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, just so those organizations have a better idea of where they stand within the Native American community. And, you know, having objectives is great, but getting to find out about those objectives is really the important part of this. So we had to have a strong method to conduct this research. And to talk about that, we're going to introduce Brian. So please tell us a little bit more about the method. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. Um, so first, like Jim said, we really wanted to come up with a robust sample. So we partnered up with Dynata and got some online sample, uh, and we completed over 2,800 interviews or surveys um, that we split into four buckets. And I'm just going to explain those four buckets real quickly for you. Um, we had about 1,000 general U.S. population interviews and over 1,000, 1,001 Native American general population interviews as well. We wanted to have that robust sample so that we could compare those two audiences um, against each other and have enough to say that we can we can identify what is a st statistically significant difference between those two populations. What makes them alike? What makes them different? We also know that if we're looking at hunting and and uh, and target shooting and trapping as three of these activities, we know that that wasn't going to necessarily pop up in huge numbers in the general population sample. So we oversampled with two additional groups one for the U.S. general population and another one for the Native American population. So we had an additional 500 from U.S. Gen Pop and 352 from the Native American. This allowed us, when we looked at the data from the activity standpoint, a robust sample there too, in order to compare against what makes someone different or alike based on what activities they participate in. First, I do want to give a couple of disclaimers, or I should say definitions. Uh, when we say Native American in our, in our survey or in our research, we're talking about people who self-identified as Native American within a question in the survey. So we asked people what, their, what ethnicity they identified with, 
And if they said Native American, we classified them as, Na as Native American. We also allowed another way to classify, which was if you are affiliated with a tribe that is based at the federal or state level. Um, and then we asked a little bit more about which tribes they did belong to. But we asked those two things in order to identify someone as Native American. What it took to qualify, well, in our general uh, general population, there was no real qualification because we just wanted to measure what the market looks like. We just wanted to see what the different populations really look like. Um, the only things that we were trying to control a little bit for were age and gender, uh, so that our sample would look like the U.S. population for both Native Americans and Gen Pop. The oversample, though, we did have some qualifications. You had to participate in at least one of those activities that we mentioned before. And when it comes to waiting, because we did a really thorough job of, of establishing the targets on age and gender within the different groups, we actually didn't have to wait too much, but we did bring it back in line so that it was representative of the national populations. And then when it comes to stat testing too, we don't want to just call out things that we think are anecdotal. We really looked at what is really measurably different, uh, statistically significant difference. So we measured all of our differences at the 95% confidence level. And because we had huge samples, we could actually see, we could actually say with, uh, with good confidence when we saw a difference between the two populations. One other thing to note, you see it in all the political surveys and everything else. When you have about a thousand people in your survey sample, your margin of error is about plus or minus 3%. So that's a little bit more about the method and what we did, but now we're about to get into the fun stuff. So I'm going to pass it off to Chuck and to Forrest to talk about the meat of this, which is the key takeaways and the recommendations that we saw in this data. So Chuck and Forrest, I'm going to hand it over to you guys. Thank you, Brian. Uh, you, Forrest, maybe if I could jump in up front here, I, you know, I'd, I'd say that we're just going to highlight uh, the key findings, a deep amount of, uh, of data for you to kind of dig through. Uh, the Jim will tell you about a bit later. Uh, you know, as a Native American, you know, I had a lot of preconceptions about what we discovered here as we started to kind of dive into uh, the differences between Native, Native Americans in Indian country and the general population, uh, some which I thought might be stereotypical. But uh, once we saw the data, uh, it was clear there was a significant difference between Native Americans and their connection to nature, uh, how they interacted and thought about hunting, trapping and shooting. Uh, it's part of who we are, uh, what we do. Uh, certainly, I can speak to that as a young man, a young kid. Uh, grew up hunting, trapping, fishing, uh, trapping muskrats, uh, very, very young, which is part of what we did. And uh, it's part of who I was. And, and I'd say that, uh, you know, we are a very connected community and it's something that I long for and something I got a part of. And we saw that in the data. Uh, and I think it's a, an important thing to, to think about. Here's a willing, uh, able and interested uh, group of almost 10 million Native Americans in North America, 500 something tribes. Uh, that want to engage in outdoor activities, a, a target-rich environment for any marketer or agency looking to uh, to call on or, or find an audience with somebody interested in those things. Forrest, what, what do you think about this data? Yeah, I, I agree, and I feel the same way, Chuck. And obviously, um, I don't think it's any surprise uh, to you and I that, that Native American populations are somewhat uniquely attached to the natural environment. Um, I mean, much of our culture uh, has been defined by those very things and, and by the dependency on and obviously a very intimate appreciation of those things. And, and it doesn't matter how far back or <clears throat> what aspects you look uh, from language to diet to the locations where we build our homes, our, our settlements and where whatever. It was all driven by resources. So, you know, you know, I think that the data just really helps us kind of uh, prove that, you know, that connection is really, really, really important. And as we go through this and look at participation across Native American populations, I think that that just further supports that. You know, as a uh, lifelong marketer, uh, we kind of described this a minute ago, uh, you know, having a willing audience that's uh, in consideration phase already, if you think about the funnel or demand funnel that you create, uh, is, is ideal. And here we have in, in Native American Indian country, uh, individuals who are closely affin you know, close affinity to target, target shooting, hunting, and trapping. Uh, you know, you can see in the data that you know, it's a very high percentage, significantly different than the general population. Uh, and for me, again, not a surprise. It's a, the case that uh, those of us grew up doing it or had ancestors doing it. It's a romantic relationship in some cases and, and then a personal relationship in others that people are both willing and interested in participating in the outdoors and doing more of these activities. Forrest? Uh, ab absolutely. I mean, when you look at <clears throat> this data, which also is not very, doesn't surprise me that well, and you think about 
you know, the previous slide and, and the influence and the connection uh, that Native American populations have with family and how they learn and how they stay connected, you know, even how, how, how they live in a household, you know, together across populations and how that influence goes. And when I look at this data, um, if I'm an R3 coordinator, I'm jumping for joy. I'm absolutely jumping for joy because, yeah, uh, it seems like we, we're often focused on how much room there is to grow. So we start on the lowest percentiles. Well, that's often the places where you struggle to get the most results. Right. And I think that, that this is a beautiful uh, set of data that really displays, hey, uh, our Native American populations are, are already more ingrained in this culture. It, it, it is more ingrained in our day to day thinking, our day to day appreciation. Uh, we find less. Uh, barriers, you know, fr from our, our own um, uh, willingness and value systems and how we appreciate uh, the more traditional outdoor heritage uh, uh, activities. <clears throat> you know, I, I, again, I've done both. I mean, I, I've recruited at, at the highest level in Indian country and on a national level in the general population. And, I, you know, I <clears throat> I think of how much opportunity uh, lies uh, in this data alone. And, and I know exactly because uh, I, I've lived it, of, of where that comes from. And, and there's just a much higher ability to recruit uh, participation, you know, as we, we're already on board and our value systems are already there, you know, and so it, it, it's, a, it's a really exciting time. You know, one of the things that, that uh, was also interesting about the data is the large variety of answers we got and the kinds of animals that they were engaging, the hunting was going on. It became, you know, it reminded me quickly that there's a huge variation in the kind of interactions um, that Native Americans in the country have with agencies, with each other. Uh, the idea that somebody has a tribal affiliation or identifies as a Native American, it's hard, as Brian mentioned earlier, hard to really kind of know whether they're actually Native American or where they're coming from, but they certainly have an affinity for it. And so that variation in, in the relationship they have with agencies is a very important to study. Uh, I know that in my own tribe, uh, our Department of Natural Resources, even though we had this willingness, struggles to get you know, Native Americans to participate, the tribal members to participate or engage and need more funding, need more tools to kind of chase that. So understanding why that is and why to drive more, more you know, engagement and, and involvement is an important thing. And being humble about the idea that each one of these tribes, each one of these kind of regions of the country have these various variations and, and different histories. histories. I, mean, you know, I, I didn't grow up on a reservation, but I have one today. I've lived away from the reservation for most of my life, but I live close to it today. We have a casino today. I serve on the board. We have a natural resource. I have assets. I don't know how to use them all. It's all part of kind of this relationship, re-engaging and any help we can get uh, to help others understand how to do that would be fantastic. For us, what's your thoughts? It, Chuck, you know, I was very fortunate from 2005 to um, up to 2014 to be a part of a very large revitalization of natural resources, especially wildlife management programs. Um, here uh, with the Eastern Man and 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 all that intended towards making sure we had a better understanding of, of what um, of what the populations, what that access looked like. What does access mean, right? It, it, there's a lot of things, and when you're dealing with a tribe with only sixty thousand acres of contiguous land mass, you know it's a very intimate, it's a very important thing because it doesn't take a lot of time to make a lot of change toward the negative, right? Um, it, you know, some things come to mind with this slide. It's a very, very important slide to me personally, um, because when you look across this country uh, and the varying cultures, um, m much of that is defined by that location and the resources that are available to and historically have been available to those tribes. And now more so than then, the amount of access that Native Americans have to those resources, you know, in comparative speaking to the to history. Um, you know, the black bear is a great example. It pops up and and you think about th what the black bear represents to some many of the Western tribes where, you know, they may not uh, physically come into contact with that animal due to what the value is of the animal to their culture. And then you come to Western North Carolina and Appalachians with the Eastern band and the black bear then serves as the most desired wild game meat there is. And we hunt we hunt them prolifically. 
and, and we were trying to manage for them uh, as the same, and, but it's a great example. So if you're manage, managing for black bears and black bear hunting at a state level in New Mexico, and you have to incorporate those gigantic land masses, say of which the Hickory Apache tribe or others, and how they view that species and how they access and how what value it has to them to really understand that full geospatial relationship, right? And because and, and management doesn't stop at political boundaries, but it does, right? And, and that's why. So I think to, to enter into this, um, it, whether you're an agency partner, whoever you are, I think it's extremely understand. It's extremely important to understand the relationship of that tribe to that species or to that activity and what it historically means to them, um, because that state and that surrounding area represents a large piece of that historical homeland and activity and, and how to connect those uh, will and does mean a whole lot to tribes. And there's not been a ton, uh, I think, of research or effort into understanding what those relationships look like as a result of those natural resource values. You know, I think there's a number of opportunities that come out of this as it relates to, you know, kind of engaging and, and, and looking for, you know, opportunity inside the data and, and inside the community. So, you know, the idea that Native Americans and tribal members love to learn from each other and they look for a mentor and they prefer to learn from somebody in the tribe or an elder uh, is a wonderful uh, kind of model for how communities come together and learn from each other. And so when you're thinking about recruitment, you're thinking about getting people involved or pulling people back in, it's not just a one-on-one -on -one invitation, it's one into a community and it takes a leader or a mentor. And you gotta think about how you kind of build that into your programs or what kind of gaps there might be. So we saw in our data that, you know, free equipment and kits could be significant uh, in this general population and also with Native Americans to kind of drive uh, that, 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 that trial, you know, they have a willingness, they're, they're really considering it and they need trial. And sometimes that's as simple as providing a method to do that. And we can see that in, in the data. I mean, this is a first uh, of its kind kind of research that gave us a view of Native Americans and how they were kind of interacting and seeing an opportunity to kind of go out and drive loyalty, I think is, is an important aspect. Uh, you know, Native Americans are interested here. I know as, as a kid, all my cousins, thought that they were the best shooter. You know, they all, and this is actually my comment on the slide because, and today, and I have lots of training, I'm a very good shooter, but I got cousins that cannot shoot me just because they've always done it. And so uh, they they love it, we love it. And, and I, I didn't realize how much difference it there was. I, you know, I thought everybody kind of had that in them, but the data clearly shows that, that Native Americans have an affinity for it and a real desire for it. You can see that in there. And I'll let you take the rest of the slide for us. Yeah, I couldn't agree agree more, Chuck. And I, I share a lot of the same thoughts and sentiment. You know, and I, I, I come when I, when I think about this slide too. I think about um, what about hiring Native American coordinators? You know, how how do we connect the agencies to the tribes at a higher level? So we do understand that we can make some connections, and therefore from those connections, how, how do we develop collaboratives and co-ops? And then grants that that aren't just based on collecting data that the states don't have and just a grant that's intended to collect uh, information that is not a, available unless you go to the tribe. I think there's a lot of opportunity with collaborative efforts, especially from the state agencies to partner with tribes on funded projects. I mean, we all know money talks, but the, the money I think can be more directed toward those partnerships and mutually beneficial activities and programs. Um, use the money for recruitment programs, collaborate, participate. We have models. We've got, we, we've beat our three to death across the world. So let's take the values no different than we would take the culturalistic values of inner city kids versus more rural kids. And let's look at Native American populations, apply those to the billions of dollars that we've spent on R3 modeling and understand how we make that connection. Because I don't think we're very far away. I think that it's just a spot that... Uh, it's 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 new. It's different. And developing trust with agencies and tribes is key. And we talked a little bit about how you do that, but it requires conversation. But most importantly, it requires a mutual appreciation for the same value set. So everybody's working in the right direction. And that's how you make the connection. So I think that through lots of things such as imagery, as collaborative participation, 
personally, uh, being in the digital media business for over 20 years, the filmmaking business for over 20 years, the brand uh, business, branding business for a long time, uh, I can't tell you a single time in my career where I have I have saw collaborations, especially from any agency level, where they're sharing tribal things, they're sharing tribal wins, they're sharing those collaborations, or they're saying, hey, look what's happening over here in Indian country, which may be in Indian country, but also has a very positive impact to our state and our national success, right? And I think highlighting those and showing that that would be a, a great thing, advocacy, uh, finding advocates and, and, and ambassadors for that is something that hasn't been done. And I know that we're going to dive into, you know, the manufacturer's opportunity a little deeper, but uh, I stick there. It just doesn't exist. And I, I think that there there's a lot of opportunity there for a promotional campaigns um, that are re definitely resource driven and collaborative in nature. You know, you know, I, I'd like to jump, jump back in here for for a minute and just kind of speak to, to the, some of the background here personally. Uh, not being able to be around my tribal family for most of my life, the desire to get back involved, uh, you know, was an important kind of gap in my life. You know, it's something that, you know, I grew up doing and then went professional and worked most of my life and didn't have the opportunity, didn't have access, didn't have tools. So I, there's such an opportunity here to help the social the social side of tribes, bringing people back together, bringing them back, you know, into what they did when they were young and kind of making them feel whole. Uh, and also from professional side to, to kind of create and recruit uh, those people like me who have desire to do it and just don't have a method or access. And I think there's a ton here that can kind of be activated and, and driven into the into the programs that you might create. And and lastly, I think there's there's no doubt. Um, again, we, you and I both keep saying it, but I'm going to say it again: is that that deep family connection and how we stick together, we learn from each other. It's so intense that, for example, in Cherokee, as throughout Indian country, when we send our our young people away to college or wherever, they have a much higher probability of quitting and coming home because the culture is so different because they are used to that type. So there's a lot of wins to take advantage of that close knit learning environment that we have there. We just have to hone in and, and everyone has to appreciate those values and how they're different from the gen pop nationally and, and hone our programs to fit. But you know, the little, the quotes in there, we grew up doing it. You go into our local high school and I don't care how those kids dress. I can guarantee you that compared to the national average, when you walk into the Cherokee Indian high school, when you start talking about the shooting sports or trapping or hunting, those kids are going to be way more comfortable across the board than the kids anywhere else in the off boundary. So this, uh, the, the last piece here is just that as again, as a marketer, and I'll, I'm gonna start with the manufacturer here. That there's just, there is no effort to kind of reach out to a loyal and willing community uh, in the manufacturing side. I've worked in the shooting industry uh, you know, for a long time and, and had a great success there, but there's no, there's no focus and no brand loyalty at this point in a group that is fiercely loyal to each other and to community and to family. So I think there's a huge opportunity to find a way to kind of engage, uh, build loyalty and trial and par partner with uh, tribal communities and elders to kind of build that loyalty. And I think, you know, when I started, started thinking about this research, we engaged it. You know, one of my hypotheses was that there was a big gap between tribals, uh, members and agencies and their trust for one another. And I was surprised in the data that there was more trust there than I thought, but there's still a lot that's not known. And there still needs to be a bridge uh, built between state agencies and federal agencies and the way they work within tribal communities to help drive participation and, and, and vice versa. There's a bunch that uh, Native Americans can do and tribal members are doing that state agencies can take advantage of like the bear program uh, that was mentioned in, in my tribe, the Pine Martin programs that we do. So I think there's a bunch here uh, for agencies to think about and manufacturers get involved with. Forrest and thoughts? Yeah, I mean, in addition to an extreme uh, degree of, of difference from tribe to tribe, culture to culture, region to region, um, the trust and relationships with uh, and for the agencies across the nation is going to vary just the same, yeah, uh, just the same. And, and, and I, I'm speaking 100% from experience. And I, many of the people that will watch this from the agency level, uh, they're going to nod their heads right here. Um, but that can change. It doesn't have to stay that way, but it does take a concerted effort. 
And it does, it does take motivation. And I think what we're learning here is there are a lot of ways to be mutually motivated. And there's a lot of low hanging fruit here that with little effort, and, and again, some real defined strategies that are mutually beneficial and the value sets uh, are all considered across the board. I think uh, this, def this really defines the opportunity. Um, I also share a lot of uh, agreement in the fact uh, in these two bullets here under advocacy, um, because I think that if, if there was a couple guiding points uh, that you could share with folks, these are two of the most important. And, and, and being someone who has really worked really hard throughout my career to connect those agency relationships to my tribe and help my fellow tribes that I that I've partnered with throughout my career to do the same. And I, I have witnessed everything you can imagine from personal agreements to personality differences to policy disagreements or sometimes just a lack of understanding. But most often it's it's a lack of alignment for, for what the value sets are and, and what data research or 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 uh, participation type uh, uh, strategies are important to the tribe. Um, I, I can't see this slide and I can't think about uh, this absolutely uh, void section of, of, of the manufacturers uh, in the industry component here. Um, I agree with you. I think that we are a ready and willing population of people that proves every day we are invested in this. We prove to be loyal over and over again. When you show Native American populations, communities that you support their values and you support what they care about, they are loyal. They are loyal. And a great example of that is from, from the folks at Nike. And so Nike, they found that across the Native American population, there was a high level of affinity to, athlete, to athletics. And you'll find the Indian country often, the schools are, are very, very uh, supportive of athletics. It's a very healthy, it's a very important part of, of our culture and especially our youth. I mean, we have a, adult sports all the time, right? Very organized. And it's at a national level, tournaments, extremely athletic group of people, you know, as far as social events that are, uh, adult youth athletics. So Nike came in and they said, hey, let us create the N7 brand where we're going to take a little bit of, of Native American art that's culturally accepted and we're going to add that touch to show the Native American community that we're focused on them and we're focused on the things they care about. And as in, in addition to that, they then developed a program that allowed the N7 brand to then inject itself throughout Indian country to do great things, improve people's lives, uh, grant programs, uh, collaborations, community involvement, those kind of things. So go into our local high school and tell me how many Nike N7 shoes you see in our kids. Tell us how many Nike N7 shirts and shorts. It's across the board. It's thousands. Every day when you walk across the res, you're going to see a lot of them. So I have to believe that there's some, some manufacturers in this industry that could follow that lead and make a connection and a concerted effort with a little bit of help and a little bit of investment of time and understanding, it, it could be one of the greatest successes that, that I I feel like I could see in, in my lifetime. Well, I tell you what, guys, uh, you know, just listening in, you know, I could see the passion and the dedication, and I saw all the hard work that. Brian and Chuck and Forrest put into this. And, um, you know, the ask now to the folks listening out there is, is, is not to let all that hard work fall on deaf ears. You know, we don't let that go to waste. There's a lot of great information um, in the full report that we have posted at outdoorstewards.org. Um, read through that, come back and listen through this webinar again, pay attention to the recommendations in here. There is a, a massive opportunity for state agencies, federal agencies, manufacturers to uh, form better relationships with the Native American populations locally. Uh, start with a conversation. It's as easy as that. Reach out, start with a conversation, listen. Um, you've got resources, you've got R3 programs that you know how to work, implement those on reservation. And um, again, substantial opportunity. The data proves and justifies that working with Native Americans is going to be a higher uh, success rate on recruitment. Um, again, if you want to talk a little bit more about this topic, feel free to reach out anytime. Um, thank you again for listening, and we hope you have a great day.